you, you cannot touch a species. You cannot kill a species. You can't be cruel to a species. You can be cruel to individuals. My name is Bill Clark. I work for Interpol's Environmental Crime Program and I do wildlife crime. The criminals are people who are motivated exclusively by money. We've had reports from customs in Thailand now evaluate elephant ivory at $1,600 a kilo. Typical elephant carries about 10 kilogram at 16,000 US dollars, a very strong financial incentive. And the people involved in it are moved by the money. There is a big problem with illegal commercial exploitation of wildlife around the world today. My name is Jason Bell and I'm the Regional Director for I4 in Southern Africa. I also head up I4's Elephant Program. Uh, one of our major focus, focal areas uh, is to end the ivory trade. The global ivory trade continues to pose a significant threat to elephants in the wild. Um, if we don't do that, um, I firmly believe that we'll have local extinction in some of these places. Uh, Chad. Um, is a country that uh, has a good chance of losing its elephants in the next five years if we don't do something to stop it. Unless all of us, and when I say all of us, I mean the whole of Interpol community, show the same level of seriousness and commitment. This problem of trading in ivory and endangered wildlife species will get worse. The reason why we are here in Gaborone is because we have this collaborative relationship with the Interpol Environmental Crime Program and that relationship was built around um, you know, working with different government agencies across the world to provide trainings for wildlife law enforcement officers. They've withstood the scrutiny of the courts in Canada. What's in this book we're covering in six days. Canadian officers covered in six weeks. It's a training and a workshop at the same time because part of the content is to review basic enforcement training techniques uh, for enforcement officers who already have some kind of experience in the field. Um, the training has involved 11 countries across Southern Africa uh, and very focused on trying to get agencies to collaborate, to work with each other, to integrate um, in the end to stamp out illicit trafficking of ivory products and rhino horn products as well. Much of the poaching is done with AK-47s, which is a relatively light round designed as a military weapon to shoot people. Well, people weigh. 70 kilos more or less. Elephants are almost 5,000 kilos. So it takes a lot of bullets and they suffer a lot when they go down. The profile of wildlife, wildlife crime changed a lot in the past 20 years. In the beginning, we were facing a poacher without organization that were trying to sell their product in the local market. Today we're facing a group of people that are well organized, well supported by organized crime and that bring those, bring those results to a scale that we've never seen before. A two-day operation in May last year, Operation Mokhatle, resulted in the location and closure of an illegal ivory factory, the seizure of nearly 400 kilograms of ivory and rhino horn with an estimated market value of more than one million US dollars. 
DNA analysis of the large volume consignments, a ton or more, um, we're finding that these are brothers and sisters and cousins and uncles and aunts, and it becomes very obvious that some hundreds of elephants closely related, single herds or small populations, have been intentionally targeted, probably by one single gang, and just, just annihilated. This is organized crime. We're dealing with groups who have very specific objective, that they know what they want, and they'll do everything to get what they want. Uh, in eastern Kenya, uh, Al-Shabaab is, is coming in from Somalia. Al-Shabaab is identified as a foreign terrorist organization. They're using this money uh, from Ivory and Rhino Horn to support terror activities. These are the same people who are involved with the bombing in Dar es Salaam. At the end of the day, uh, the criminals are ahead of the game. The ivory is poached in one country and exported from Africa in another country. Well, that's because the dealer doesn't want to sit in the same country where the poaching is being conducted because the risk of getting caught there is greater. We have to get a handle on how we prevent ivory moving through various countries and ultimately ending up in consumer nations. Enforcement people have to get organized at least at the minimum as much as the traffickers are. If we can do it, we're going to be effective. If not, we'll have to see the evolution of the extinction of species worldwide. I think being able to be a part of protecting animals is really important for me. Um, I come from a scientific background. I've always had an interest um, in policy issues, um, in politics, um, and in advocacy. Something that's really interesting to me is this, this collaboration between a, a global enforcement agency, um, an NGO who happens to also be working in the region, uh, but then also Environment Canada, you know, a government from the developed world. Um, yeah, you're bringing in people with uh, expertise from all over the world. All these instructors that are there have over 20 or 30 years in, in wildlife law enforcement. You're the trader, you're not supposed to say too much thing about it. My name is Richard Charette. I'm senior advisor for the chief enforcement officer, Environment Canada Enforcement Branch. We've been to the point where, where I think uh, education is no more enough. I think we have to support these enforcement officers who are risking their life in the poorest country of the world and make sure that we equip them, that we give them the appropriate training and that we protect them. My name is Josias Mungawa. I come from Zambia. I'm a senior investigations officer there who is in charge of operations. Definitely wildlife trafficking in Zambia did really happen, more especially now when people use Zambia as a transit point. Since yesterday, I've been trained uh, to know different ways of investigation, how to interview witnesses and uh, suspects, and I'm still learning. If I give you some examples of what we're doing during the training, uh, one of the most obvious one is the search warrants, and make sure that the uh, chain of custody is well maintained through the process so that they build a solid evidence to bring in court and be successful. Trainings like this one, would definitely help us a lot, more especially in southern Africa, where a lot of ivory trafficking is being done. And we already seen people explaining their problem and finding solution from comments coming from other participants in another country. Me, as a person representing Tanzania, I can't, I, I can't attend conservation go alone. A number of them have commented on the fact that they'll be able to go home, make contact with each other again, and really develop that network. And that's the first step um, in being able to combat the illicit trade. You really need to know who you're talking to in different countries, and there needs to be a regional kind of approach. I think communication is the best tool we have to get really engaged in the fight. Two weeks ago, some people in Kenya picked up an ivory dealer with seven kilos of ivory. They filed an eco message with Interpol. The fellow was wanted for homicide in the UK. We have a mechanism called eco message, which 
countries report significant cases of wildlife crime to the Interpol General Secretariat. It's the only database on Earth which has the names of wildlife criminals and, and uh, organizations, uh, businesses. Uh, if we don't have intelligence-led policing, we're left with random policing, and we just don't have the resources. During the past four years, Interpol has coordinated four operations, resulting in the recovery of more than three tons of contraband ivory, tens of thousands of carved ivory products. One of the main outcomes from this training is a, is, is a management plan for an enforcement action to hit the domestic ivory markets across Africa. This training is in preparation for another operation, which I anticipate will be more successful. The training is a very interactive training. Who is the lead officer? Tell me now, who is the lead officer? Who's all of you are doing a search, one in a vehicle and the other one in a residence. It is a type of training where you cannot sit down for long, but we're trying as much as possible to bring them in a real-life situation so that when they'll be back in their country, they will know how, with the support of Interpol, to proceed with uh, this particular operation. I'm 100% sure or optimistic that the, the operation that will be planned after this training course will definitely be a success. We're benefiting from lessons learned. Each time we do an operation, we keep track of what went well and what did not go so well. I anticipate better results. Uh, a quote from the American president, Abraham Lincoln, who once said, if someone gives me six hours to chop down a tree, I will pass the first four hours sharpening my axe. And that's what we're doing here. Aggressive law enforcement. Aggressive meaning we want and we insist on applying the law.